Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Rogue Trader with me, Regaton. Let's report our completion and emphasize that there are absolutely no mishaps and no friendly fire incidents at all whatsoever. The Vox caster is producing nothing but static. Hello, can anyone hear me? Ishara's voice cuts through the static. We read you, Strike Team. This is Lift Control. Report your status. Erlon is dead. Ishara responds after a brief pause. Acknowledge strike team. Beginning the extraction of the priority cargo. That includes me, right? A fine victory, Donald. The tell saga is about the day the contemptible Erlon fell. The cock priest should offer you a fine cup of miad for saving their prayer world. Several nods to the two gaunt bodies in crimson robes lying on the floor. If you hadn't, Erlon would have bathed them in a hundredfold more blood. As for you, Ever, O Far Thunderlung, you have proven yourself. The Stormbiters will tell all about your feet and your roaring song. I thank you, Thorbold. You and your brothers fought well. You did the wolves proud. It'll be my joy to share a cup with you at the victory feast, Ironhide. How's your pack, Thorbold? What are your losses? Several of my brothers would carry on fighting their battles in the Allfather's host. The rest have survived. We've shed much of our blood. But a wolf's hide is tough, and his spirit is stubborn. Once you take us down, you better finish us off. The Stormbiters live, on this day and the next. I see you and Ulfar have worked through your quarrels. It doesn't become a noble warrior to bark at his battle comrade after a good fight. Ulfar Thunderlong has proven that the spirit of the Baleful Hell is alive and strong. Let the ravens fly where he has walked, and let them tear at the bloody harvest left in his wake. May Black Mane guide you through the Black of Night, Ironhide. Know that if your pack calls, the Belfo Hell will always answer. That's a reference to Ragnar Blackmane, I think, who is the youngest Wolf Lord. What was hidden down there? What was the treasure that Erlon was after? I know not. Kakazar's Karls did not allow anyone into the hidden arsenals. All we could see is them dragging crates up to the surface. Tis the age-old way. We fight. They sweep up the spoils. Thorbold grimly nods at the pair of corpses. We brought these from below. For all I know, it's just Carl's that killed them to seal their lips. You see no signs of violence on the two women's bodies, but their porcelain white skin proves without a doubt that they are dead. Their hands are clutched together in a death grip. The sweet scent of rotten meat prickles my nostrils, but it's not the fallen bodies I smell. It's the hands of the Inquisitor's minions. Is what my instincts tell me too. My heart never had a strong faith in Calcazar's words before, but now whatever phantom trust I had is scattering into smoke. I must ask questions and get the answers. By force, that is the way it has to be. Both wolves affirm the last words with energetic and murderous nods. Heinrich casts a grim glance at the mighty warriors, but does not contradict them, either out of agreement or doubt about his survival where he to raise an objection. Examine the tech priest's bodies. Something strange occurred to the two women's augmetics. It's like they began to grow inside their flesh, spreading webs of metal around them. After taking a closer look, you realize that every augment seemed to have begun mutating, developing new forms and functions not envisioned by their creators. It seems probable that this is what caused their demise. Axiomantha. Suddenly, you hear a click inside one of the tech priest's bodies, and her eyes open wide. A spasm shakes her gaunt limbs, making like Thorbold clutch his weapon. Her lips twist into a crooked line, forcing out two words. The yoke. She's still alive. Call the Medici. Reconstruction. Impossible. The woman's whisper is barely audible, but the weak voice that is coming from her pale lips still sounds more alive than the mechanical hiss of a vox. The shelter has fallen. The maimed hunter comes. Cessation of vital functions inevitable. Her eyes momentarily roll back, but then a metallic chur inside her chest brings her back to consciousness. Inspect the tech priest's wounds. There's not a single wound upon her white skin, but there is no doubt that she will soon perish. Pragmatics are failing as if they were sabotaged by some entropic influence. For a moment, you consider it a sign that of the tech blight. But then you refute the thought. 
When you're witnessing is not decay, a transformation of the matter from which the tech priest's true flesh is made. Who are you? Magos, Axiomantha Hanuman. That is my identifier. And we don't have Pasca with us. You're not the first servant in the Omnisai I've met who goes by that name. The tech priest responds with a faint and enigmatic smile. You found yourself at the center of a tangle of paradoxicality. You spoke of a shelter and a maimed hunter. What did you mean by it? This place was a shelter. The Lord Inquisitor hid me here, and not me alone. A high-pitched groan of pain interrupts her words. The maimed hunter, a figure of termination, an unknown variable. Emirnat's nemesis. I never met them, but I inferred their existence based on statistical evidence and logical conclusions. The portents of entropy foretell that the hunter is near. Can you speak more plainly? Are my words obscure? That is regrettable. Processing becomes difficult when you only have one half of your mind. Certain notions, data, and logical instruments were left, and the less functional part of me. How do you know about Amarnat? I was a disciple of the Messiah of Discontinuing. When he was laid low, I found myself here. I hid from my reckoning. I reached out to the Omnisai's wisdom as I pondered and considered. Logic revealed much to me even here, in my prison. Point at the dead tech priest. Was she your sister? She was me. A phenomenon of flesh divided me into two identical bodies at birth. The Omnisai's wisdom let me overcome this physiological flaw by bringing back the separated mind. I was the first unificate in the fleet. Now this half of me is dead. The rest of my mind is fading. The sympathetic principle is insurmountable. The tech priest closes her eyes and starts whispering something incomprehensible, sticking deeper into the depths of oblivion. I have learned enough about you. If you wish to know more, then hurry. The turning of the cog will soon cease. What happened to you? A pain shadow falls on her face. The chapel was attacked. The preservation protocol commanded me to hide within the inner artifactorium and block all outside access to it. The long presence and close proximity to the object was prohibited by the algorithm, but the preservation protocol had a higher priority. The object affected me. I resisted. Resistance led to structural change. What object? The yoke. The weapon we forge at the Lord Inquisitor's command. The destroyer of worlds. I need more details. How does it work? What even is this yoke? An enigma. The project was kept secret from everyone, including the smiths. We forged fragments of it. It was a tool for controlling energies of staggering power, and it was not the Omnisai's blessed gifts that served as its foundation. It was forbidden knowledge. Knowledge that we comprehended. Heinrich shakes his head in amazement. A yoke. A means of restraint. It sounds like a project on a grand planetary scale. And this is the first I'm hearing of it. Perhaps there was a hidden purpose to my assignment besides combating the cult and accompanying you, Donald. But why? What else do you know about this weapon? How did Kakrazar learn of it? Against whom does he intend to use it? Against anyone. Its power is absolute. The first experiments with this tech relic were calamitous. The tech blight is merely its echo. Its potential is so much greater. She stops, as if frightened by her own words. I never should have fallen into the hands of the laity, but the Lord Inquisitor stole it. Its secret is procured beyond the dimensional gate, beneath the dark stars, passed over to Amonat. Kakazar destroyed the Messiah of Discontinuing and robbed him, and claimed the secret for himself. He knows. She points at Thorbald. He was there. Thorbo glances at you in shame. She speaks no lies. The first task the Inquisitor gave us in the Expanse was to destroy a cult of tech heretics. The deed was done. This Amarnat, was he a good priest? Did Kalkazar drag us into something foul? Elfar looks away and rumbles heavily. I was there too. I fought those judged by Kalkazar. Why did Kalkazar need you to do it? At first he tried to do everything swiftly and quietly, 
but his agents and the cog priests loyal to him failed to capture the leader of the tech heretics. That's when he realized he needed indestructible warriors. He needed us. The cog carls were powerless against the wolves' might. We brought carnage to the explorer ships and worlds. Ofar, why did you keep quiet about this? Ofar mutters. The expression is dark as a storm cloud. It wasn't my interest. There was another's will. And it's a chapter's matter. I've already told you more about the wolves than many of my brothers would have said in my place. I respect your oaths. I do not think less of you. Thank you. Ofar looks away. They can barely make out a string of Fenrisian curses. You can surmise who their intended addressee is. What else do you wolves know about Amernath? Thorbo throws up his hands. Nothing. I swear on my honor. He disappeared, and so did his ship. There's no blood of his upon our hands. And what do you know about the secret weapon? I never even knew there was a weapon. I was sold of traitors, and I tracked them down. I claim no trophies. I no part in any dark intrigues. You think I would have wished that sneaky, scheming viper to get his hands on something so powerful? I wouldn't even trust him with my axe. It is not my place to judge you. You are following orders. Thorbald frowns and says in a hollow voice, and yet doubts smother my heart. Did we sell our chapter's honor with deeds done for a dishonorable end? How exactly did the object affect you? A difficult thing to explain, the layman. Metamorphosis phenomena occur in the object's vicinity. Sacred technology and even ordinary plasteels start to behave willfully, shifting, restructuring, and altering their fundamental attributes. Imagine yourself gazing upon a surface of water that was disturbed by a stone an era ago, but the ripples never stopped coming. That's what it felt like. The object propagated echoes of change. Why are you revealing Kalkazar's secrets to me? I was never his servant. I was forced to serve. When our circle was broken, he offered me a choice. Submit or die. He threatened to kill half of me if I refused to forge for him. He needed Archmagos Amarnath's knowledge, and I had it. I saw no sense in resisting. I doubt I can learn more from you. It's difficult to process. Have I fulfilled my duty to the Omnissiah? May I rest now? She looks through you like she can no longer see you. You're in need of help. Attempts to slow down the degradation process are irrational. They only prolong my suffering. I wish to cease to be. Her eyes close. Even if we saved her, the other half of her is dead, so it wouldn't... It wouldn't be good for her. Brother, take my thoughts. I kept them. Keep them now. Her final words are a faint whisper. That's addressed to Pascal, who isn't with us, so I'm sure we missed some fairly important dialogue with that. Well, it's good to know we can always go back through the dungeon after we defeat Erlon. I assumed after that we'd be forced to leave. So we meet again, Ulfar Thunderlung. Thorbald gives Ulfar a stern nod and turns a steely gaze on you. Live long, rogue trader. Business has brought us to your Drekker. The traces of Halbrand's encounter with Ulfar's rock hard forehead are still fresh on his face. The young wolf rests his hand on his axe. Greetings, brothers. What brings you here? Ulfar returns Thorbald's look with an equally fierce glare. For some reason, he has forgotten his magnificent armor today, and stands on the bridge clad in little more than the physical perfection inherent to an angel of the Emperor. Live long, comrades. 
Fenris Hilda. Fenris Hilda. We thank you for your hospitality and kind words, brave Huskar. Thorbot's face breaks into a wide grin, his affected severity vanishing from his face. He rambles solemnly. Brother Ulfar, you swore that you would stand for the honor of your peck, the baleful hell. Did you descend to Euphrates too with your brothers? Did you fight? That world my boots did shred, and fallen halls my victory cries I roared. The day the Allfather asks for a reckoning of my deeds, I'll not be ashamed to tell of the siege of Euphrates. Who will bear witness of the truth of this wolf's words? I will bear witness. We know you, Donal. We have seen you in battle. We believe you. Show us the scars, Brother Ulfar, that we may see the mark of your deeds in the flesh. I did not acquire my scars to show them off, Brother Thorbold. Show the scars, brother. Show the scars. Thorbolt's cry is echoed by the other wolves, banging their fists on their armor in the time, in time with the words. The ship begins to vibrate. Look more closely at Ulfar. Ulfar's decision to appear at this meeting without his armor suddenly makes sense. You're watching a ritual. No far show of modesty is merely a part of the performance. You yeah, join the chorus. Show the scars. Uh, let's observe silently. That's more in line with my character. And we say the, uh, some of the greetings because that's part of being a commissar. You make your units work cohesively together. That's more of a respect thing. But we're not going to participate in the, uh, the chorus. So, observe silently. Ofar turns with ostentatious reluctance, let the light fall on the fresh marks he received on Euphrates too. You had no idea he had suffered such deep and grievous wounds. The crowd erupts in roars of approval. Thobot raises his voice to shout over his brothers. Do you take a glorious trophy in that battle as a token of your valor? Alfara moves the horn he wrenched from the hell brute from his belt. He notices that it is already carved with Fen Fenrisian runes. The wolf proudly shows the trophy to his comrades, causing another explosion of cheers. That's not the name of the X that I thought it was. That's okay. A proudly thunders the baleful howl. Praise the Allfather for sending us such formidable and valiant brothers. Double makes a gesture, and Halbrand removes a magnificent axe from his belt, presenting it to Ulfar with a deferential bow. Except from the Stormbiters, this gift in honor of the battle that was fought shoulder to shoulder. Ofar, I see you've decorated your trophy from Euphrates too. With something of a flourish, Ofar shows you the angular yet graceful script of runes that wind down at sorry, wind around and around the gleaming horn. When I return to Fenris, I'll drink beyond from this while singing the saga of my march into the Coronas Expanse. Ofar, give us a look at your new axe. Thobar grins with pride as he looks upon the magnificent weapon. Our rune priest tempered it in the blood of the despicable word bearers who fell in Euphrates too. The blade is enameled with bone meal from the tooth of a Fenrisian kraken, and inscribed on it are the names of all the brothers of the Baleful Hal Pack. You know that a name is inscribed on a Fenrisian weapon can mean different things. I misread that. You know that a weapon inscribed on a Fenrisian weapon can mean different things, whether glorification of past heroes or commemoration of the fallen. Ulfar runs his fingers over the symbols, lingering first on one name and then another. You're no expert in Fenrisian runes, but you can make out these two, Arnulf and Skjaldi. Thank you for this gift worthy of the Varagir, Ironhide. Ulfar tests the weight of his new weapon. His face bears that satisfied expression seen only on the faces of true warriors who have found the perfect weapon for their hand. So that's it. You're all best friends now. Of course, Road Trader. Ulfar is our glorious brother, and any one of us would gladly die for him. Do not seek to understand wolves. Only one born on Fenris can understand the nature of our friendship and our enmity. And the Stormbiters are my brothers. It has been an honor to hunt with you all. 
Thorbald, we now tell Ofar where to look for his brothers. Wolf hands you a data slate. The coordinates displayed on it are a monstrous distance from the inhabited worlds of the Expanse. I will not stand in Ofar's way if he chooses to go searching, but... Brother, you've proven the glory of your pack. Is it not time to sever this weird, weird thread? With respect, I once again extend my offer to join the Stormbiters. The pack's plastic marks are resting in Thorbold's outstretched hand. Forgive me, brother, but I must decline your offer. Then my heart's heart fills with the joy of the thought of fighting alongside you. Ofar draws a knife adorned with scarlet runes and slices his palm. I, Ofar Thunderlung, swear before the Black Mane and by the blood of Fenris, I will not cease to seek my pack until my own eyes behold them alive or dead. I understand, brother. Thorbald sighs with regret. May Black Mane run beside your path. Fortify yourself. Stoke your rage. I see that your heart is darker than the waters of the World Sea. So I ask you. Take care that you do not join, those of whom we must not speak. Of whom you must not speak. He's referencing the Wolfen. Hobrant clears his throat and opens his mouth to reply. He catches the sharp glances of Ofar and Thorbold and swiftly changes his mind. You do not need that knowledge, Eidvater. There are paths in the forest that only wolves ought to tread. So what now? Well, we should probably return to our Drekker. He sends a question mark at the end of Thorbold's statement. Ofar's face becomes serious, and he gives you a significant look. I can hardly let the glorious wolves of Fenris leave without first treating them to a fine feast. The wolves burst into shouts of approval, and someone with a gravelly voice starts singing a merry song. No doubt one about massacres and glorious deaths on the battlefield. The kitchen servants here are certainly no match for those serving in the Great Hall on Fenris. But the masters of this drekker are not lacking in hospitality or generosity. A small group of space wolves is enough to fill your entire magnificent ship with clamor, shouts, and other portents of the coming feast. A formidable feast in which eating, drinking, and singing will be done the way wolves do all things. To their last gasp. Oh, we don't get to see it. Let us raise our cups at Vator, in honor of deeds accomplished and in expectation of those yet to come. So now you know where your brothers are heading, what will you do? Help you to deal with the enemies who besieged your home, and then head for the coordinates that Thorbald gave me. Well, I know, Edvater, that you are dauntless, and if I but say the word, you will join me in my seeking. But the place I will voyage to is a perilous one. Few can survive in it, and though duty leads me there, I do not want my debt to be paid with your blood. If you're willing to talk about yourself now, I am listening. It is wise to hide one's past from a stranger, but shameful to hide it from a friend. Ask away. How did you become an Astartes? I was a seafarer. Every spring we would go out onto the World Sea and slay many armed krakens and ravenous sea drakes. And then the season of fire would come, and we would dock on Asaheim to battle for our clan's right to inhabit that land. I was young, but already fierce, and facing down foes twice my size. The chooser of the Valiant, who had watched the fateful battle from the cliffs, deemed me worthy and took me to the Fang for healing. My clan was proud. 
I spent years in training before I passed through the dreaded gate of Morkai, bowed on the rune stones before both his heads, and walked into the Valley of Dreams. As for what I saw there, do not ask me. That is between me and the Death Wolf. The rune priest scoured my soul, but found it untouched by corruption. I returned, and I partook of the cup of Wolfen. The Canis Helix entered my blood, and the agony of transformation changed my body to resemble that of a beast, and my mind was drowned in the dark depths of bloodlust. So the Space Wolves are one of the few chapters that actually retain their memories after becoming an Astartes. Not all Space Wolf chapters do, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, Space Wolves are extremely long-lived. They live for hundreds of years. Uh, Dante, the chapter master of the Blood Angels, is like 1,500 years old. And so you... I don't think it's ever been confirmed, but I guess Space Wolves, as they just get older, they may forget their previous life. But some are psycho-indoctrinated, so that they are forced to forget their their old life, so they're only a Space Marine. But I think, uh, like the Salamander, Space Wolves, they all remember their, their previous lives. My return from the dark was long and cost me greatly. When I stood in the hall at the Fang once more, the rune priests imbued my body with the remaining gene seed and implanted the necessary organs. But those trials were nothing compared to what I had already endured. His face darkening, Wolf continues in a subdued tone. What happened in your final trial? When I overcame the darkness of Wolfen in my soul, I set out for the Fang. Every neophyte must undergo a hunt during this journey. One might fight a fearsome wolf, another a sly snow worm. I crossed paths with a doppelgrendel, a cunning and rancorous spirit. In a gravelly voice that sounds like cracking stone, Ulfar answers. For five days and nights did we bring our wits and wrath to bear in battle. The spirit changed its guise, but in the end, I gouged out its eyes. Fleeing, it hissed a curse. Nowhere would I find an honorable death, vowed the creature. My saga came to an abrupt and inglorious end, like a noble banner moldering and fraying at the edge. When I made my return to the Fang, clutching that crushed eye, the rune priest looked at me, and his face grew grim. But he said not a word, save to confirm my victory. You believe the creature's curse holds any power? Everything on Fenris has power. I have fought in a hundred battles and suffered a hundred injuries. Even wolves are not certain to survive such grievous maiming. But I always survived. And with each new victory, my thoughts took a darker turn. What if I truly am destined never to die with honor? What if my death will be foolish and inglorious. Each time I bury a brother, I secretly envy him. Ulfar's mournful words land heavily like cliff rocks cleaving off into the sea. His face darkens until it resembles a grim idol hewn by a primitive people. I think this is a good point. His death may not be glorious, but he's achieved a lot before he dies ingloriously. But what if it is not a curse, but a gift? A gift of long life and many great exploits. A gift straight from the Seven Hells! What is the valor of a deathless warrior worth? Where is greatness in the exploits of one who shrinks from death? When the wolf time comes and my fallen brothers march into the final battle, where will I be? Sitting along in a fang, beside a fire that went out long ago? Alfar bellows angrily. So the wolf time is kind of like their Ragnarok. It's when uh, 
their Primarch, Lehman Russ, or Roos, is supposed to come back. And uh, the Emperor is supposed to get off the throne and lead the Imperium into one final battle. So, again, very reminiscent of Ragnarok. And unfortunately, there's a book called The Wolf Time, which was just aggravating marketing by Games Workshop. Because it had nothing to do with Lehman Roos, and it... <laughs> oh man, I was... I was agitated to say the least. The ages weigh heavily on my hands and heart. And one day, I will be too tired and feeble to wake up and rush into the fray. What will they call me then? Ulfar, who slept through the battle? Ulfar, more Kai's unwanted. At the last words, Ulfar makes a gesture to ward off evil. He subject recruits to heinous trials. Why? The path of Aristartes leads into the fangs of horror. Any threat that can be endured by the mind is one that mortals can handle. But we are needed where the unthinkable begins to happen. Things that understanding cannot help to bear. Things that, once beheld, turn minds into bubbling, pulsating drag. An ordinary man who encounters this evil will go mad with despair. But we are incapable of feeling fear. It is simply not in our nature. Instead, we feel unbearable rage. We must select the neophytes who will look into the eyes of the unthinkable and roar. That is why we need our trials. Many times Sorry, I, I have see. heard the clinking of Morkai's fangs next to my ear, but I have never allowed him close enough to sink them into my rump. Ulfar well, words off evil with a superstitious gesture. I wish to know more about your pack. We call ourselves the Baleful Howl, and our sign is known to all wolves. We are old wolves who have seen much and endured much. Ulfar well, proudly points at his shoulder pad, which is emblazoned with a crude depiction of black fangs. A shadow of disquiet dampens the warrior's boastful exuberance. This is the great black man wolf, patron of slayers and totem of our great company, the black manes. All know that we are fearsome and hungry for a struggle of war, that we are cunning, deadly, and show no mercy. Speak our name, and thunder rolls. Off our points at the other shoulder pad, depicting a black beast head. It declares in the tone of one instructing. The uh, Ragnar Blackmane books are pretty fun to read. They they go into a lot of detail, especially the first one, into the process of becoming a, an Astartes on Fenris. Even among the brothers, my pack are counted as the most rabid glory hunters. When we were young, we knew no taboos or limits to our pride. Years passed, and suddenly we are veterans, but our avaricious hunger for exploits is undimmed. The giant space wolf's words seem to radiate heat, as if from a roaring fire on a winter's night. Tell me about your path in the wolves. A complete accounting of all my deeds would land like an avalanche upon you. I earned this mark of endurance when I slew a chieftain of an Eldari tribe. He dealt me a serious injury, and the wolf priest said I would not survive it. But it has not killed me yet. Two years I lay in a delirium after that battle. Ulfar proudly points out a marking on his armor in the form of crossbones. When I awoke on Fenris, I set out for the wastes at once, and there I hunted a black-maned wolf and killed it with my bare hands. For that feat, I was granted the rank of Wolfguard. <laughs> that fearsome beast remains with me to this day, and I carry his furious spirit. Ulfar affectionately strokes the wolf fur laid across his shoulders. 
A wolf guard are the space wolves assigned basically as an honor guard for the uh, wolf lords for each company. So he would have been a honor guard for a Ragnar Blackmane. And Jarl Ragnar carved this one when I beheaded a despicable sorcerer, the arch despot of Tyrannica II. Many brothers fell victim to him, and we do not sing that saga before mortals for the preservation of their minds. Alas, I failed to behold my own glorious deed. My eyes streamed with blood, and I hunted down the sorcerer by scent alone. Off our points are what looks like a claw mark. The warrior's bragging demeanor fades away. His voice becomes thick and dark like poison in a goblet. And of my glorious victories, there are many more. Besides, not for nothing did the Yar grant me the accolade of Terminator. He probably displays a sigil on his chest. A stone seal in the shape of a wolf head on top of a cross. Huh, that's cool. I have noticed your penchant for poetry. Before becoming an Astartes, I dreamed of becoming a Skjald, a keeper of stories. At feasts, I often sing of my brother's exploits. Thousands are stored in my memory. When I am near, wolves fight even more ferociously, for they know their deeds will be immortalized. One of the tech priests theorized that our songs contained hidden psychometric codes to increase courage. Maybe there is such a thing in other places, but on Fenris, our sagas are spun from memory, from respect, from pride. More than words stringing, a secret weaving, magic in its marrow, not to ear nor mind, speaks the saga. Its spell sounds deeper strike, and the heart hearkens. Your brothers call you Thunderlung. <laughs> that is my moniker, yes. My voice knows no fatigue, whether fighting or feasting. I can recite the glorious sagas and terrify foes with my battle cry for hours. <laughs> oh, this fine name was given to me by my loyal friends, Arnulf Bloodyax and Skjaldi Twice Thinker. Oh, for chuckles. Tell me about Arnulf and Skjaldi. The bonds between us were many. Arnulf was my sworn brother. It was he whom I faced down in the battle where the Chooser of the Valiant noticed me. Arnulf too was deemed worthy. We went from bitter foes to setting aside the enmity between our clans and becoming close friends. He gave me this blade to show that the past was forgotten. Quick to laugh was Arnulf and fearsome in a fight. <laughs> Almost as fearsome as me. Alfar shows you a blade covered in red runes. Skjadi twice, Dinker. Well, he was sent to us by the Allfather to see that we did not meet our deaths as young pops. He had enough thoughts in that head of his to make do for me and Arnulf both. It was Skjadi who taught me to compose verses. The spirits prized his wisdom, and the runes hearkened to his voice. When the Xenos took me prisoner, Arnulf caught up with them and slew a score of them with his fine axe. And Skjaldi called down a storm so mighty that the Abomination's jet bikes were whipped into the wind's furious currents like leaves. But even that was not enough to take them all. We were captured. Tarvantius took Skjaldi first and turned his body into... something unthinkable. Then he took Arnulf, and during the many hours of torture, my brother's only response to the freak was a disdainful laughter. 
And then, he fell silent. Hmm. Both good options. I'm not sure which would be more Commissar-like. Probably option one. Let's do option two. This means you must perform feats of glory in their honor, that their names may, may be remembered a thousand years hence. And their sagas will be sung in the Hall of the Immortals, sowing valor in the hearts of the young. Thank you for your answer. I enjoy telling stories. Answer a few questions about yourself. What do you want to know? I enjoy telling stories. I must take my leave. Fenris Yoda, Edfather. Alright. So I, I don't pronounce all the Fenrisian words exactly like he does, but I'll just consider that a gothic accent. <laughs> Where he has a Fenrisian accent. Alright, so we got a new axe. Singer of Fearsome Sagas, so I definitely thought this was going to be Krom. That's it. Axes have a special attack that inflicts bleeding. I mean, the. I thought that other effect might be better. But what's a space wolf without an axe? The power axe. I thought it was going to be a frost axe and his portrait. So, the wolf lord, uh, Krom Dragon Gaze. I assume he's going to be part of the Drake Slayer Great Company, which is Krom Dragon Gaze's company. Because the axe looks just like Wormclaw. Which is Rom's X. I mean, it is a spitting image of Wormclaw. That's the uh, symbol of Morkai there, the two headed wolf. That's neat. Cool looking weapon. Glad to have it. All right. Uh, I'm going to call it here for now. Next time we will speak to some of our companions like Pascal. I think Nomos as well since we found all those data crypts. And then we have a couple rumors I want to pursue before we head back to Footfall. There's a couple we never found the solution to. Um, like this one I think. So I'll go and check that out before we hit a footfall, just to make sure I didn't miss anything. I'll go through the rest of the rumors off camera and decide which ones I still need to pursue. But either way for now, thanks for watching, I'll see you guys in the next one.